Good evening. I'm Raj Dave and today I want to talk to you about how innovation and art of intervention has been the cornerstone of our specialty and heart of C3 meeting. Let's look at our history. In 1970s, Andreas Grunzig first introduced balloon angioplasty. It was not until 1987 when Dr. Julio Pamas implanted a coronary stent in Brazil. In mid-1990s, FDA then approved uh, coronary stent implantation with a bare metal stent in the United States. As you know, as an interventional community, we struggled in the bare metal stent era with problem of restenosis and stent thrombosis. However, as an interventional community, we never gave up and we improved our implantation technique and developed dual antiplatelet therapy. Then ushered in the era of drug loading stents, which resolved the problem of restenosis and with improved design, now provides better safety. In this journey, now enters bioresorbable scaffold, biodegradable polymer drug loading stents, as well as polymer free drug loading stents. These new drug loading stents are the focus of this year's C3 meeting, and I welcome you to join this exciting discussion about these new technologies. When I implant bioresorbable scaffold, it reminds me of our interventional community struggle during the journey of development of the stents. It requires meticulous technique of implantation. Whether bioresorbable scaffold will ever change the natural history of coronary atherosclerosis, remodeling, and improve angina, these questions can only be answered by long-term clinical trials which are ongoing and will be performed in future. While we go through this era and experience the explosion of these new stent technologies, I welcome you to join me in watching a video of how we meticulously implant bioresorbable scaffold. We will have in-depth discussion about techniques of bioresorbable stent implantation as well as features of other new drug loading stent technologies at this year's C3. So I'll see you in Orlando in 2017 in June. Thank you. Welcome uh, to uh, Holy Spirit uh, Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory. So today the intent is to show you uh, the meticulous implantation of the bioabsorbable uh, stent. So I'll give you a very brief history of this patient. He's a 58-year-old gentleman who was presented uh, to our office with a um, uh, Canadian class two angina pectoris. He underwent a nuclear uh, uh, cardiology stress test, which demonstrated significant ischemia, hence he came for cardiac catheterization uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, at that time, he was found to have significant proximal LED and a right coronary disease. His right coronary artery uh, uh, was treated in the last setting. Uh, the RCA FFR was 0 0.76 and was treated with an OCT and two drug loading stents. And he returns today for uh, proximal LED uh, treatment. So um, if you look on the, uh, in geography, uh, clearly he has a large uh, LED and uh, in geographically a significant disease in the uh, proximal LAD. So this is an area where you don't see a, a large side branch that's involved. That's number one. Number two is a young patient is an isolated uh, a segment where no, uh, hopefully no overlapping stents were required. So I feel this is an ideal uh, situation uh, uh, for a bioresorbable uh, stent implantation, this patient would qualify, if he were part of a uh, absorb uh, study, would qualify for uh, participation in the study. So it's really ideal uh, uh, anatomy. So the way we implant uh, bioresorbable stents in our lab is by very meticulous uh, technique. So the first thing we did here in this case is to perform an OCT examination. And let me review the OCT with you. Now, if this lesion was very severe, 
uh, then what we would have done is we would have balloon dilated the lesion and then we would have performed the OCT. In this case, I felt that we would be able to uh, perform an OCT examination. So you can see this now, this is the OCT catheter and an OCT run was done. Uh, and let me now show you the OCT images. So we'll go from uh, distal to uh, proximal. So here is a relatively healthy uh, segment of the vessel uh, where you can see <coughs> um, there is not a lot of stenosis there. And now we are coming into the disease segment. So here the minimal uh, luminal area was 2.9 millimeters square. And then a lot of plaque. Then there is a uh, lumen. And then there is a second uh, stenosis right about here. And here the area also, again, was 2.9 millimeters square. And then now we get into a proximal LAD, uh, which is, uh, has a large lumen. And here's the origin of the circumflex coronary artery at 9 o'clock. And now this is the left main uh, a coronary artery, and this is the aorta. So I did some measurements here. So I felt that this was a good landing zone for the proximal BRS. And here, and I will measure this lumen for you, it's about 3.6 millimeters. And then this is the whole, this is the area, and this is our distal landing zone. Here, the uh, reference area is about 3.0. So there is a little bit of a taper in this RA from 3.0 to 3.6. Um, uh, and the total length of the lesion is 28 millimeters. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pre-dilate this stenosis with a 3.25 by 20 NC track non-compliant balloon. And then we will implant a 28 millimeter stent and we'll repeat the OCT. Down. <clears throat> so it's good to do good pre-dilatation, and I use a lot of non-compliant balloons for uh, this nice pre-dilatation, so there, there is enough room. One more test, one more test. It's good, go. 18. Okay, down. Yeah. So this was an undersized balloon for the proximal LED and one-to-one -one sizing for the second lesion. Okay, so picture please. Okay, looks good. Okay, may I have a 3.5 by 28 absorb? And then after placement of the absorb, we will do post dilatation, and post post dilatation will repeat an OCT run. And we may have to do proximal optimization in the proximal portion of the stent, but we'll see. Uh. So this is the biodegradable, bioresorbable rather, absorbed device, which has two markers, platinum markers at two ends of the stents. Okay, 
small tasks. So what I'm going to do just for um, educational purpose, you can see there is a marker on the balloon, and then there is a platinum marker on the stent. So I'm going to inject here under Cine, so you can see both markers. Okay, perfectly placed. Go ahead and inflate. Twelve. Okay. I'm going to keep it up for about 20 seconds here. And may I have a 3, 5 by 20 NC track? Okay, down. Twelve atmospheres. Fifteen is fine. Okay. So this is a three five by fifteen and C balloon. In our lab, we do ultra high pressure inflations on this particular stance. So first we'll get to the distal edge. So I don't want to be too much outside. Okay. 18. 20. Okay, we're going to keep it inflated here for 15, 20 seconds. Okay, down. One second. Okay, so I'm trying to align the proximal marker of the balloon with the marker of the bioresorbable stent. Okay, another 20. So we're gonna allow another 15 seconds or so. Okay, deflate. Okay, so excellent uh, post-dilatation is a critical step in this procedure. So now what we're going to do, which we do commonly in our lab, is to perform OCT and angiography both at the same time. That saves the contrast. You know, this patient has normal renal function, but if patient had abnormal renal function, that would be of uh, benefit. So we'll now do the OCT and angiography both at the same time. So, Lauren just hit the new recording. Okay. So, what we're going to look for is clearly stent expansion, apposition, edge dissection are the key, uh, or any geographic miss. So we want to have a good guard position so that we can see properly. Okay, auto calibrate. I'm going to flush the catheter with the contrast to make sure that the contrast is catheterized dye free. 
Karen's gonna inject now. Okay. All right, so angiographically it looks perfect. Uh, there is no uh, angiographic dissection. There is a full expansion of the stenosis, but we wanna make sure that we correlate angiography with imaging in this case. So I'm gonna go now and, and review the OCT images with you. So the first we're gonna look for where this is our landing zone, which is the distal reference. <coughs> and we're gonna look for the area where we see the first struts. So you can see at two o'clock there are two struts here. And here's the vessel, the struts are all well opposed. There is no edge dissection, which is a good news. This is a minor um, uh, malaposition due to the um, uh, oblongity of the vessel. We are not gonna be concerned about that. You know, again, there is a branch here at uh, nine o'clock. That's not concerning. You know, there is full expansion everywhere here. Full expansion, full expansion, no malaposition so far. Uh, there is another branch that came at, at noontime. Uh, also, this is the proximal portion of the LED. If you can now see that the struts are beginning to get less and less, that appears to be the distal edge. And here is just the very proximal portion of the stent here. And I'm gonna go back here and d measure the distance between the strut and the vessel wall. So it's less than 200 microns, so this is not a major Malaposition, I'm gonna leave this alone. So this looks very acceptable. I don't think there's any further action to be done here. And we are done with the procedure. So no more angiography needed. You know, we have already done the angiogram uh, with the OCT, which you can see now. Uh, the OCT shows very good opposition. He's already on a dual antiplatelet therapy. So this completes this uh, procedure. Thank you very much.